Welcome in, everyone. So sorry for the technical difficulties. So we had a little issue there, but um, yeah, we're in. So we're just going to wait for the room to fill. Uh, we have uh, a lot of doctors signed up for this webinar. So my apologies for the delay, but at the same time, it's going to be very valuable. And so I'm really grateful for those that are here. So we got a nice crowd back. I think we're going to go ahead and jump in. And so I, again, appreciate everyone's patience. Welcome to the webinar. This is about caring for emergency patients while protecting yourself. And so as I was mentioning a few minutes ago, in order to give the best care that we can in this moment, in this unprecedented scenario, we have to be able to have be taking the best care of ourselves. And we're going to talk about that in a number of different ways and how it pertains to our teams and everything else. So uh, my name is Dr. Brett Gilbert, and I'm coming to you live from Chicago, Illinois. And, you know, my background is I was born and raised in, in Maryland. So I originally trained at the University of Maryland for both my undergrad and my, my dental school, as well as my endodontics. And so very proud of that time. I do have my own private practice here in Chicago, King Endodontics. I do teach at the University of Illinois and work with the Department of Endodontics, really teaching the postgrad residents. I've uh, been with them since 2004. And up at the top right, the diplomate of the American Board of Endodontics, probably the thing I'm most proud of. That's something, it's a distinction that endodontists have to pursue outside of their schooling. And only about 20 to 25% of endodontists are board certified. So um, just wanted to give you some understanding of, of my background. Um, I'm really into social media. It's just an amazing way to communicate. It's an amazing way to share. I would say that endodontics in general has, has such a strong presence on social media. There's so much learning that you can, you can gain from following endodontists, from following different types of, of practitioners, teachers that'll present you with cases, present you with philosophy, uh, certainly all the regulatory agencies. Everyone's out there trying to help you. And so uh, Instagram is my main home. That's where I really live. I love it. I've got a number of educational videos on YouTube. So you can check out my channel. It's Dr. Brett Gilbert. Uh, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, my, my practice website is kingendo.com. My personal uh, professional website is drbrettgilbert.com. And that's where you can find my live lectures and things like that. Obviously, it's going to be a little while until uh, we get back to that, but what a beautiful opportunity to present to you virtually today. And again, with that comes you know some some technical glitches from time to time, but we're running strong now. And then in the middle there, you'll see the Access Endo. That's my online education platform devoted to intensive and comprehensive endodontic education. Uh, it is a membership subscription. You can visit us at accessendo.org. You can join. It's month to month. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to earn CE. Right now, we have almost 40 hours of CE credit available that you're able to uh, earn with your monthly subscription. So as we jump in here, I want to talk a little bit about our course objectives today. So first and foremost, I know that there's uh, probably a big range of who is on this webinar. Some of you who have already been treating emergencies through this COVID crisis and others who have you know, really shut down the office. And so I wanna give you a real look into my office, into my practice, what we've done. But more than that, more than just a protocol presentation, I wanna talk to you a bit about the mindset that you need in order to step back in. And what happens when you get into that first morning huddle the day you're back and having all of your team's eyeballs on you looking for complete confidence and leadership. And I, I want to give you my own experience of how that went for me and how I might advise you to, to go about that. And we're going to talk about best practices and in infection control. And I think the biggest message I want to lead with is that I know for certainly in my office, for the most part, infection control has been on autopilot for many, many years. My team is very experienced. I'm very lucky. They've been with me for a long time. And it's been a great opportunity for me to have people I can depend on to do it right. But the world has changed now. The perception of infection control is going to change from a patient standpoint, from a team standpoint. And so although I'm going to just present to you sort of a flow of infection control, I want you to be thinking about it differently. I want you to be looking at it through a different lens because the mindset of it has changed. And I believe that when we walk back into our offices, as I did almost immediately after this whole crisis hit and that first emergency patient presented to the office, that there is a tremendous amount of confidence and leadership that's necessary on our parts 
the dentist part. And it's important that when you walk in, you are ready for that. You're ready to essentially take on a little bit of a different role, a more elevated leadership role. I know for the most part, we're very empathic as dentists. We care about our teams. We care about other human beings. And sometimes we don't want to, you know, we sort of tiptoe around things when maybe they're not done exactly how we want. And unfortunately, in this time, that's not good enough. And so it's gonna, we're going to talk a bit about when you're in these team meetings about really setting a standard of we have to be on point here. We have to be on protocol. And that means that sometimes I might speak to you in a way that's more directional and telling you, look, that the way you have your mask on is not good enough, or we need you to adjust your goggles, or really being nitpicky, because that's what it's gonna take. And that includes getting into the lab with your gloves on and really on a hands-on approach, going through with your team exactly how you want the instruments processed, letting them show you what they were doing and instituting changes. It also includes getting into the rooms in between patients. This is a whole new level of disinfection of the rooms. And so what I did for the first week is I went in every patient with them and I was in there scrubbing the surfaces, showing them the type of effort that it's going to take to get it done right. And so the, the idea here is I want to give you some best practices for infection control. I want to highlight some of the resources that are available to us from the commercial end to help us kind of get acclimated. But most importantly, that you get in there and get your hands dirty and show your team that you are the leader and you're willing to do anything to make sure that infection control is handled right. So those are the objectives for today and let's, ju let's jump right into it. So this is all new and evolving almost on a daily basis. And on the first huddle that I had with my team, I said, the way we're going to do things this morning may look different by the afternoon as we get more information, more bulletins, more updates, more emails. This was before the slew of webinars hit. And of course, webinaring has become our only method to teach and how beautiful that it was ready to go for us in, in the technology was there. So we really must stay in tune and also be very dynamic. You know, we get set in our ways a little bit and we found in my office that we've actually been able to get into a groove very quickly, but we have to always be willing to shift and flex because there are new things that have to be in, implemented right away. So triage is critical, you know, understanding what is an emergency, what is an urgency. I don't wanna dive too deep in that today, that's not really the full scope, but the reality is, is that a patient that's in dental distress, that's the best way I can look at it. That patient needs to be seen. Now, there are other situations where maybe from a perspective, perspective or perception of the patient, if an incisal edge of number 10 breaks away, that might be something that's distressing to the patient. But by distress, I mean that they are in pain, they have infection, it's affecting their daily life, okay? So as we move in here, some of the precautions, number one, the patient must be interviewed 24 hours prior to the visit. And I'm going to show you a few of the documents that we're using to really go through. And so this is essentially a verbal survey or interview. This typically happens uh, through my team, although I've done the interview as well, as has my associate, Dr. Sinnenberg. And so this is something where we just have to get a good baseline as to if this patient could have been exposed are they having any symptoms? Have they been exposed to anyone that's had any symptoms? And of course, in the beginning of this crisis seven weeks ago, it involved you know travel and have you been anywhere? But now since it has been seven weeks, most people have been grounded. So the travel part isn't quite as, as important. Once the patient arrives at the office, their temperature is taken at the door. So in essence, until we have a confirmation of an elevated temperature or a normal temperature, we don't make the decision as to let the patient enter our space. So this is a whole new world. You know, you're coming at them with a, with a, a no-touch thermometer. It's worked out well. There could be a situation where a patient has a fever in relation to their dental disease or abscess. And so we have to, again, be dynamic and take account that the condition of the patient dentally might affect the fever. And so if a patient's swollen out to here with a fever, you may be more open-minded as to what the etiology is. And maybe it's not that they're, they're ill systemically. Uh, now, it's amazing that the waiting room is no longer a waiting room. That waiting room is empty. The waiting room is now the patient's car. And this, I think, is going to stick. I think this is going to be a new normal for us that patients will, in fact, be waiting in their car before they're able to enter the office. So that means that if they haven't done the paperwork online, they're going to be doing that in their car. They're going to be sitting in the car and waiting until the room is ready. And so this is a very 
significant departure from what we're used to, but it's logical, it makes sense, and the patient's in their own comfortable space. So it really, patients have been very, very understanding for all of this. Um, uh, only one patient gave me some pushback. Uh, you know, I don't want you to take my temperature. I don't want this. I don't want that. Uh, he gave my team a hard time and I went out and spoke to him and I said, Hey, you know, we've got hoops we have to jump through. I really want to help you. I would ask for you to just be patient, understand. I have to take my own temperature three times a day, you know, so just work with me. And he really did calm down. You know, patients are stressed out um, and there's a lot of concerns right now in, in our culture, in the whole world. And so we have to be very understanding. So I try to present this to patients as, look, this is what we have to do. We're doing it for your safety and please just work with us and understand that we ourselves are jumping through hoops as well. So one other significant change is only one patient is in the office at a time. That includes no accompaniment. So I did have one emergency patient, the poor gentleman was in a walker. He really had a hard time moving by himself. We did allow his aide to come in. She, her temperature was taken as well. Uh, her, she was questioned as well. We did the interview with her. Now, obviously the aide and the patient are with each other 24 seven as she's an in-home care person. So, uh, but we did allow her to come in and help us get him in the chair. And then we had her come in and, re and help him leave the office. But that's it, other than that, only the patient is allowed into the office. Um, again, the patient questionnaire, um, everything that they do, uh, we have a consent form. Um, this is something that you see probably going around and being emailed to you. There have been some consent forms that just basically say that you can pick up this COVID-19, this SARS-CoV-2 bug anywhere. So it could be at the grocery, it could be at the pharmacy, it could be from someone you know. There would be no way to pinpoint that it was possible that you got it here. But it also speaks to the fact that a dental office could be a hotspot. And so we, we recognize that, but we also want to be clear that if you want to be treated here, you have to consent to the idea that there's no way you could possibly trace it back to our office. So again, this is just some of the basic overviews and precautions that we're taking. So when it comes to the patient entering the office, we immediately give them gloves and a mask. Now, I know a lot of doctors are, are taking patients immediately to a hand wash station, and by all means, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But in my mind, if I can get those hands into gloves immediately, okay, and of course, we have their medical history, so if they're latex allergic or something like that, we can accommodate. But I want those hands in gloves so that there is no chance that the surface of their hands are going to touch anything, and they wear them the entire time they're in the office. They're also given a mask immediately. So that if they were to cough or even in their speaking to our team, that the droplets, you know, saliva, et cetera, can't escape. Uh, once in the chair, so patients been through already a gamut of precautions and now they're in the chair. Now we're going to have them rinse their mouth. So as we've all understood from all the learning that we've had to this point, that the virus is sensitive to hydrogen peroxide. Uh, the hydrogen peroxide you get out of the bottle from the pharmacy is a 3%. So we dilute it down. We do, you know, one part of hydrogen peroxide, two parts water, and we have the patient rinse for at least a minute. And this is just a precautionary way to say that if there is any virus shedding within the mouth, that at least you're starting out with your exam, you know, taking any type of oral, intraoral x-rays if you're going to do that, that at least you have some baseline of kill. And some of the literature, especially in the endodontic circles, has mentioned 0.2% povidone iodine. Um, this isn't a, a solution I'm terribly familiar with, but apparently is successful at, at killing some of the virus. So I want to just go through again. You may have seen some of this. I've taken some of the slides from a wonderful webinar that was given uh, from the AAE on their endo on demand program. This is a slide from Dr. Kenneth Hargreaves, who if you're endodontist, you of course know. If you're not, you can just know that this is about a person that when he speaks, everyone listens because of his credibility and his knowledge. And so some of the basic questionnaire items as, as you all are probably familiar with at this point is you know any history of fever in the last 14 days, respiratory illness, cough, difficulty breathing in the last 14 days. Um, have you had any household members had contact with that you maybe has been known to be diagnosed with COVID-19? Um, have any international travel within the last 14 days? Again, now that we're almost two months into this, it's not likely anyone has traveled, you know, anywhere of significance and has any household member had a history of exposure to COVID-19 biologic material. So you might consider someone who's living with a nurse or a physician that's at the hospital or the doctor's office. And so just basic common sense, uh, this is going to be the type of questionnaire that would be asked to a patient over the phone.
Uh, these are the documents I was alluding to. So you have essentially a patient disclosure, just describing again, similar things about fever, about illness, about symptoms. Sometimes you have to ask a patient the same question several ways, and sometimes you get a conflicting answer. And so by interviewing them night before, interviewing them before they come into the office, you just are double checking that the patient is, is being truthful. Now, obviously a patient could tell you any answer that they want, but I think in general, given the circumstances and the consequences and our public's responsibility to each take our role in fighting this, patients have been very forthcoming and we, we greatly appreciate that. As I mentioned, there's an acknowledgement, um, essentially an acknowledgement of risk form there on the left. And what that's essentially saying, like I said before, is, hey, a dental office could be a hotspot. People are coming and going. We're doing everything we can possibly do. If you contract COVID-19, it would be impossible for you to trace it back to this space. And the patient's agreeing that they understand that. Now, will this hold up medical legally? I don't know, but it sure seems logically like the right thing to do. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the PPE because this is something that obviously is top of mind. What will you need? What's the right thing? There's a lot of conflicting evidence and, and discussion going out. You know, for instance, some of the research showing that a surgical mask and an N N95 don't have a significant difference. But OSHA has released guidelines stating that really in order to be safe in the presence of aerosols, you must have an N95 or KN95. Again, if you're not aware, a KN95 is essentially an industrial grade N95 mask wasn't intended to be used for medical purpose, more for, you know, different types of particles that might be used in industry. But there has been that sort of push through approval from the FDA to allow us to use them because of the shortages. So let me be clear in saying that I personally had a guardian angel that in the very, very beginning of the box of he knew what He knew what was about to happen, however that was. And I'm so grateful for that because that allowed me to proceed almost immediately into treating patients because I was able to protect myself and my staff. So what I say, and you look on the right side, we are in a new paradigm. So I always like to say, I was telling my wife the other day, you know, the day of like throwing on your white coat, your little paper mask and going right into the room. Unfortunately, that's just not reality anymore. And it happened like that. But the reality is now that we have to be fully PPE'd up before we even go in and say hello to the patient. And so this is the process. We're going to go through that here today. And I just want you to, to understand that, in my opinion, we are going to be able to find more comfortable. There'll be innovations. There'll be new designs for PPE so that it's more comfortable to wear. Right now, it's, it's really pretty uncomfortable. But again, it's mind over matter. And I'd rather be protected and be able to serve than to worry about whether my face hurts or what have you. I've got marks over my face at the end of the day now. Um, but the most important thing I want to reiterate, wherever you are, whether I know there was a number of you from Canada on here, a number from the U.S., is we must as dentists support organized dentistry now more than ever. And I mean with our time, with our money, with our membership, with our participation, because there are going to be new regulations. There are going to be new standards. And we have to be sure that dentists' voice are involved in that. Otherwise, we're going to be caught under a political backlash where we're going to have to spend a lot of money and do a lot of things that aren't logical to us. Now, a lot of the information I've been sharing, I've been doing that because I think it's critically important that the public see that probably dentists are about as well suited to handle this as anyone. We're totally used to wearing PPE. We are so beyond, you know, the highest level. I was going to say anal, but the highest level of being concerned about infection control going back decades. So we are well suited to handle this. And I want you to feel that confidence that you, with your training as a dentist or an endodontist or an oral surgeon, with your team's training, I know there's some team members on here, we are well suited to handle this safely. And so we want to approach it with confidence and we want to take every precaution and never let up, but not also to be afraid. We can do this. And we've been doing it in my office really for the last seven weeks. So 
my PP and I'm going to describe it. I'm going to show you some videos, show you what we're doing in the office is certainly the N95 at this point is the standard. Although there are some, some studies that would show evidence that with the particulate matter, even at 70%, which let's say a level three mask would be that you would be safe. But again, the OSHA has described it as N95 being the safest. And so um, you can put a clean mask over that. Now, interestingly enough, before this hit, I literally had no idea about the different levels. It just so happened that the mask I wore that was comfortable for me was a level two. The mask my, my, my partner and associate, Dr. Sinnenberg, wore was level one. We didn't know it. Now, level one and two will be basically gone, and we're going to be dealing with level three and above. So I'm doing a N95 with a clean mask over it so that I can reuse the N95. And I've done that. I've worn them for, for more than a week in some cases, making sure they're protected, they don't get wet or soiled. And I'm saving each one because there are, and as I'm going to discuss, some concepts about sterilizing the masks. So think about how short what a shortage we have how important this is i wouldn't throw one away for the life of me so i'm i'm saving them in sterilization packages and i'm going to show you some ideas that some of my colleagues from around the world have sent me about how to sterilize but i haven't sterilized them yet i'm sort of waiting since i do have some fresh ones i can still rely on so this is an example this towel uh, sterilizer was sent to me by my friend Mehdi rahimi in sydney australia um, something that you could potentially just bake them in the oven and be able to use them over and over again. I've noticed that the elastic straps are depending on how it attaches, whether it's ear loop or straps, the elasticity may loosen and they feel much different when they get looser. So that's a little bit of a concern. Uh, we do have to learn how to fit test these masks. So you have to be sure that they're sealed off. And when you breathe in and out, they sort of puff in and out when they're sealed. So um, you'll get more, more used to it once you start wearing them. A disposable surgical cap. Again, we don't want the aerosol to get into our hair, onto our skin, so we're wearing surgical caps. A, certainly a disposable surgical gown as long as you can get them. Um, and that's very, very important. These are also very much in shortage. So we have to be very dis dis discerning about it. I'm typically wearing one for a whole day and then I'm disposing of it. But as we see the supply dwindle, we may want to spray them with Lysol each time as I'm doing. I am spraying them to disinfect in between each patient, but we may want to continue to do that even for a whole week. So we have to really weigh what's ideal, which would be to strip everything off every time and throw it away with what's practical at this point in the crisis. Surgical foot covers. Again, you don't want the aerosol to fall into your shoelaces and the, the cloth of your shoes. So we are wearing those now. At this point, we are unable to get foot covers. So we're, we're you know, making do with what we have. We have elastic plastic covers we use for our keyboard. We're putting those around our feet. Um, some of the head bonnets, the surgical caps, we're putting those on our feet. So we're basically just making do with what we have. Um, a neck cover, again, I can't get a neck cover, so I'm using these white disposable towels and tucking them in so that the neck tissue and skin is covered. So a lot to consider with getting yourself covered. Now, goggles is a big one. Um, so, you know, the side shields and especially for you loop wearers, this is a challenge, you know, because the idea is I think about the aerosol coming up and it can get into your eyeball and be able to transmit through there. So I want my eyeballs closed. Now, even the big face shields, you know, that it still could get over or under. And so I'm wearing closed eye goggles. They're not very comfortable. Um, I've made some accommodations to try to help with that, but it's more important to me to know that my eyes are completely sealed off. And so I'm wearing goggles, uh, but you know, many will, will go with a face mask and you wanna use what's, what's comfortable for you. Air purification, as I mentioned, I think will become a huge topic in dentistry now. And even the potential in my mind, I don't know this, but in my intuition, I feel like air quality testing is going to be a part of dentistry. Just like they come in and test the radiation off of your x-ray units, they could come in with a monitor and make sure that the air quality is appropriate. So some type of air scrubber, you know, I have surgical air scrubbers, as I'll show you in the video, something on that line, you know, an air purification system. And then fortunately, if you'll notice the, the verbiage, the, the, the talk about negative pressure airflow in dental offices has sort of quieted down because in all honesty, it's so unrealistic. And some very uh, innovative dentists, I've seen on Facebook, et cetera, have actually created negative pressure vacuums, which means that it's pulling the air out into some other receptacle or the outside space um, with a negative flow. So basically as an aerosol is produced, 
it's rushed right out through the ventilation or, or through some other filter. And that's obviously ideal. But to outfit all the dental offices everywhere with this would be near impossible, especially if you're in some kind of office building. Um, you have to break through a window to be able to let it escape. So we're hoping that as I'm going to show you some, some other items that are obviously coming on the marketplace, ways that we can control aerosol to the best of our ability and, and hope that it's certainly enough. And I think in all honesty, the testing will show that some of the air purification systems have monitors on them so that you know what your air quality is any minute to minute. So I'm going to flip into a little video here and kind of show you exactly what we're doing. So this will be the first video and, um, just want you to see essentially what my air purification system looks like as well as with me with my PPE. Hey everyone, so we've been getting a lot of questions about how we're managing this COVID-19 outbreak and still treating emergency patients. So you can see some of the gear, we've got the headgear, uh, closed eye goggles, we've got the N95 with a, a different level one mask, or these are actually level two. Um, I also put my uh, surgically clean air unit in between my two operatories. So this way I know it's not negative pressure, but it is the closest we can get to be able to get the, the air is being pulled in from the bottom and the fresh air surgically cleaned out of the top. So taking every precaution that we can to stay safe, keep our patients safe. But uh, just wanted to show you what it looks like in reality and um, we'll post you up again soon. Hope everyone's doing great. Sending so much love from Chicago. Keep your heads up. We'll get through all this. In the meantime, let's just be as safe as we can. Sending love from Chicago, can't stop, won't stop. Okay, so just to give you an idea what it all looks like, and I'm gonna show you a couple more videos as we go through. So let's talk again about some of the over overview. So we've talked about essentially getting the patient to the office, getting them in the door, getting them outfitted in glove and mask, uh, getting things going in that way. And so now we're at the point where the patient is rinsed. Okay, we are in our PPE, we are ready to go. And now we're going to talk about some of the precautions related to the procedure itself. So number one, and um, this was really a, a brilliant stroke, uh, and it wasn't my idea. Um, but my, my contact was a doctor named Ryan Facer in Utah, who was able to very quickly recognize that we had an open nose and that we really wanted a barrier over the patient's nose. What if the patient sneezed in the middle of the procedure and that aerosol came out and was all in our space? So using a positive pressure oxygen flow through a nitrous mask was it the concept of being able to place a barrier over the nose, give the patient a beautiful flow of oxygen, and if they were to sneeze or cough and anything were to sort of try to come out of the mouth, you have a barrier covering there. Now I'm using in this picture a silhouette. Those are the disposable nitrous oxide type masks. Uh, so it's a wonderful way I can, I can say to the patient, you know, uh, as part of the COVID precautions, we wanna have a barrier over your nose. It's gonna be a little fresh, refreshing oxygen flow. And this is a disposable one-time use cannula. So this is a very reassuring thing to the patient. They've been very uh, accepting of this. We do charge a bit so that we can accommodate for the cost here. And maybe that would be, I know one of the doctors did a little research for us as we were uh, doing the startup today, talking about that there's a code where we can charge for extra PPE. And that might be a great code for our, our disposable type of oxygen or nitrous oxide mask. So I think that's a big piece because now I have rubber dam, especially in endo. I've got nose covered. I've got eyeglasses on the patient and they're about as protected and I'm as protected as I can be from them. Again, the eyeglasses, that goes without saying. I think for the most part, we do that. Now, once I have the patient uh, under the rubber dam, ready to start the procedure, I'm then gonna take 3% hydrogen peroxide and essentially douse the surface of the tooth and the rubber dam with the 3%. So again, I've already had the oral rinse that was first. And now before I start my procedure where aerosol can be created, obviously making an endodontic access, I'm gonna have another layer of protection by hopefully disinfecting with the hydrogen peroxide. Obviously a rubber dam in any situation is gonna be uh, very, very important in a general dental office setting with hygiene, et cetera. Obviously that's not possible, uh, but for now any rubber dam placement is gonna be helpful. Wanna limit the aerosols as much as possible. So what does that look like for an endodontic access? In some senses, what it looks like is the second I can get into the pulp chamber, I'm gonna switch in many cases to a, a low speed burrow, a slow speed, so that I'm not creating the same aerosol. 
And the same thing is going to happen with ultrasonics. We rely on them so much in endodontics. But until I get that pulpal tissue out, I want to make sure that I'm not creating an aerosol spray. Um, some of the early reports, and this is empirical, I don't have data on this, but I've learned from some of my physician friends that they found that the uh, blood is actually a significant vector for the virus. And so until I have that vital pulp tissue, and especially in irreversible pulpitis cases, until that's out, I really try to limit the aerosols. Now, once I've completely instrumented, once I have a lot of sodium hypochlorite in the tooth, in essence, I now am in a safe space to complete treatment. But a uh, limiting aerosol, limiting ultrasonic is important. And we do find that as far as the endodontist, that we are going forward to completion of treatment. And this is multiple fold. Number one, you know, we don't know if this patient is going to contract the virus and become infectious later. So we don't want to try to do too many visits and have more exposure of this patient to us and us to them. So if we can definitively treat and then also in many cases put a more definitive restoration, then this patient could go six months or more, which is probably very likely with the backlog that we're going to see in hygiene visits, in, in dealing with all the different emergent situations that arise from patients being unable to access dental care for so many months. So we're trying to be very, very definitive in endodontics. And that's where a more definitive restoration does come into play. So I want to talk a little bit about testing. I think this is a very valid thing to consider because I think as we move into the summer and into the fall, the idea of dentists being testing sites for COVID-19 and for SARS-CoV-2, for the IgIgM immunoglobins, you know, we want to be able to be what, what is essentially a really logical place for patients to be tested. Not only that, it would be so great to confirm the patient's viral status before we were to institute treatment and potentially have aerosols coming from this patient that could remain in the air for some period of time. So um, obviously, this is again a slide from the AAE. Uh, they've been very, very upbeat with you know providing information, making sure that we're up to speed. And it's clear that, um, that probably starting in January, there will be a specific code for us to test. But until then, and that more extraneous sort of um, D0999 unspecified diagnostic procedure code could be a valid code to be able to submit to insurance for this type of testing. So we're not there yet. And I don't even know necessarily that the tests themselves are there yet. But I saw a wonderful webinar last week by Dr. Leslie Fang. May, many of you have probably seen some of his webinars. He has one tonight as well. The idea is that you no longer have HIV researchers. You have COVID researchers. You have no, you don't have any more cancer research. It's all the most brilliant minds and labs in the whole world are working on this problem. And so you have to understand that there is going to be rapid innovation, rapid advancement. And so I do foresee where we will be submitting and uh, codes for and actually uh, doing the test for patients, hopefully in the very near future. Um, I wanted to bring this up. This is again back to Dr. Hargreaves lecture, the idea of you know, what was the experience in Wuhan uh, after the outbreak with endodontists? And this was a study specifically that involved endodontists. And what this shows is that out of 18 endodontists in this study that were working in the dental area, they were taking care of emergency patients just like we are. They were wearing all their same PPE, including N95, face shields, you know, head covers, all of that, and found that none of them became infected with with COVID-19. So that's really, really important to know. Now, when they identified patients that were actually exposed or had the, the disease, the virus, those patients were treated in a more isolated unit and they wore essentially hazmat suits. They also found that those doctors did not contract. So this is a really important little bit of evidence. It was only for like a three week period, but Dr. Hargreaves presented it and I really re it really resonated with me to say that if we take care of everything the way we need to, if we follow the protocols, we can treat patients safely. And I think that that should give some reassurance. And as I mentioned, because I'm going to ask you to really stand tall as a leader to your team, that these little bits of information allow you to feel confident and for you to sort of exude that confidence so that your team grabs a hold of it, they feel confident, and you guys can charge forward as a team to really take great care of patients. Right when this started, uh, really the same week that uh, schools started to close, et cetera, the AAE reached out to me and said, would you 
create some kind of editorial piece about how you see this situation. And it was really a unique opportunity because I had to really sit down and think about what's the most important message I would have for my colleagues right now. And what it was, was number one, the realization very quickly that we've gone from endodontists in the normal practice that we've done for so many decades. And now all of a sudden we were really being pressed into duty at the front lines. You know, we didn't still know essentially how quickly it would spread. We didn't really know if the PPE would hold up, but we knew that we needed to be there for patients so that the patients in severe dental distress would not go to the emergency room and overwhelm the resources there. And so endodontists just sort of picked up the ball and started to move forward. And my, my message in this article, and you can read this on the AAE website, was just that we need to manage the emotional toll of serving during a pandemic. Meaning that when I go into to the office now, and even if I just treat a couple of patients, it's a lot more tiring it's really takes a lot out of you because there's so many things to think about. You want to do everything right. And so my advice to all of you, you know, whether you're in the office already or preparing yourselves mentally is take care of yourself. Self care is so important. Make sure you're getting your sleep, make sure you're eating right, getting your exercise, staying mentally focused, but also allow yourself to have a little fun and not be worrying and feeling anxiety all the time. Be able to give yourself that little bit of a break so that you can keep yourself strong so that we can get through this. And I have truly adopted these types of habits myself. And so it's allowed me to really continue to feel good, to feel good about my position, to go into the office and treat these patients. Um, like I said, we've gained a lot of confidence over the last seven weeks, but I'll tell you what, going into the office week one, day one, I was scared. I will admit that to you. I was scared inside. But when I got up in front of that huddle, the first huddle, and I saw my team members looking at me for guidance, and immediately that fear drained out of me, and immediately my knowledge, my training, my preparation, everything that we already do kicked in, and I knew that we could do this as a team. And I'm so proud of my team. They have been truly amazing through this whole time. Um, so I'm going to go into just another video just to show you a little bit more about, you know, some innovations that are coming and how we can look at media as an opportunity to really help us. So this was a great video. Hi, Wayne Remington back again with uh, an additional barrier protection that you can use while using your surgical microscope. And this is to protect the operator from spray from patients. And again, this is taking the same bag we took earlier, the clinical chair cover bag, poking two holes in it for the oculars. We're going to take our rubber eye cups off. Slip this over the oculars. Now we have a barrier so that when we're looking at the patient, when we're working, we have. Okay, so um, so just that was a that was a great idea that I was able to institute. Now, many of you asked about this in the prior chat, but so this is something that really intrigues me, and I'm actually working right now to figure out how to implement this. But the extra oral suction system, so essentially a high speed hood, a high speed suction that could collect the aerosols right at the level of treatment. Think about hygiene. You think about think about what dentistry can do in this situation. You have a patient that has viral load in their mouth. And you take a high-speed handpiece and literally the air blows out and just distributes this. So if we can catch it at the point, and these are just a couple of different brands and there's a lot of these coming onto the marketplace. I'm actually really trying to work with how this might fit into endodontic practice, although I think our aerosol production is much less. But some type of extra oral suction system might ultimately become the standard. And I just wanted to be able to mention that to you to keep your eyes open. So... That's really the COVID-19 precautions that we're taking, although I did miss one video I'm going to get back to right here. This was another video just to show you what we're doing in the room um, and just to really kind of share with you what it looks like in our operatory. Hey everyone, just wanted to share with you what we're doing here in the office. Obviously the PPE, which I've shared before, we're covering our N95 masks. This is Lily, one of my amazing team members. Uh, I have to acknowledge my team, they've been so amazing through this whole ordeal. 
So you can see obviously doing most everything that most would do. Everything is brought in and out of the room each time. So you can see everything is individually wrapped. We're not keeping any extra supplies. We have an additional team member that will bring them in for us. Um, I think one of the interesting things we're doing with the microscope, which has been really helpful, is creating a little barrier. So this way the patient is behind and I'm in front. And so just the oculars are exposed. Obviously everything is wrapped. Uh, just wanted to share with you what we're doing. We're also using, uh, we're using the, the silhouette. This is gonna be a nitrous oxide mask. So each patient will get one of these, they're disposable just for positive pressure oxygen through the nose as another barrier. So, so many things to consider. I know as you're starting to get back to work, you're gonna be thinking about what you need to do in your dental practice. I think another area that we all have to consider is air purification. Um, I've shared before about my surgically clean air unit that we have here. Uh, this brings the unit, the, 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 the air up through the bottom, surgically scrubs it and up out the top. We also have some smaller ones in the rooms called the Jade unit. So just a lot to consider, but um, it's doable. Uh, we've gotten into a great groove and flow. Again, my team has been amazing here at King Endodontics and we are treating patients for emergencies. So as you start to get back to work, thinking about what you need, please reach out to me. We're happy to be a referral source. All endodontists, uh, oral surgeons, anyone who's been treating patients through this is gonna be a great opportunity to help teach you, get your office and your team prepared. So sending so much love from Chicago, can't stop, won't stop. We're gonna get through this, but in the meantime, as we get adjusted to what is the new norm for dentistry, we adapt, we move on, and we continue to serve our patients. So sending love, Mwah. Okay, so just to give you an idea of what we're doing, and, and one of the most important things and something that you can really make valuable use of your time right now is to clear out your operatory so that every surface can be wiped and everything is brought in individually so that at the end of the appointment, we can completely wipe everything down. Now, as we go on, I do believe, I, I don't know if you've seen some of these foggers. There's some foggers that will send disinfectant out over every surface. That could become a very, very effective way to disinfect. So a lot of innovations happening, keep posted on that. I see some great questions in the chat box. Um, now I'm going to move into as, as we're kind of be mindful of your time and especially with the delayed start is just some concepts of infection control. Now normally this would be a real bore, right? Because an infection control for the most part is on overdrive in our offices. And I admit that myself. I'll step in every once in a while and institute something new. But for the most part, the team is doing a good job and we allow them to do that. But now is the time to take on a more hands-on role. And look, this is a, this, this webinar is sponsored by Cavo Kerr. Thank you to Cavo Kerr for, for allowing this opportunity to happen. But it doesn't really matter which company you were to work with, but using a commercial resource like a Cavo Kerr rep, at this point in time can be a really great opportunity to get the latest and greatest understanding of what needs to happen. And so having a meeting with them, maybe inviting them into your team huddle, letting them really review what you're doing to make sure that you have everything in place that you need. And I think that that's a really great first step and something that can happen virtually while you're still at home before the office is open to make good use of this time. We have to be very mindful of the CDC is very clear on which types of disinfectants are effective and which ones aren't. And so it's important to recognize that, you know, something like a cavi wipe or cavicide is certainly uh, recommended against the SARS-CoV-2, which is the actual obvious virus that we're dealing with. COVID-19 is the disease that incurs from being infected with it. So just being very aware of what products you have in the office and are they CDC approved to, to really get rid of this virus. So. Infection prevention and infection control are gonna become such buzzwords, as will air quality, in my opinion. And so you wanna be emailing patients. I know a lot of my referring doctors and friends are really trying to stay in communication with their patients, that's beautiful. I'm um, having notices either at the door, handing it to them when they get their paperwork, when they come to your door, and just letting them know that you're following all the CDC, uh, EPA type of, of guidelines that of course are always changing. Um, this is just a way to reassure them that dentistry is a safe space, reestablish the trust, and just remembering always that it's all about the patient and making sure that it's a safe environment for them. So what to look for in a disinfectant? You know, there's a lot of different things. You know, are you dealing with something to the level of bacterial spores? You know, are you dealing with uh, just different bacteria, fungi, et cetera? And just being sure that you're lining up 
what you're using to clean the rooms with what's effective. And obviously everything has a different price point. And I think from an infection control standpoint, now is the time to make sure that you're using very reputable products. So this is a really important slide. And the reason is, is because the first one on the list here of your inventory of PPE is heavy duty gloves. And so these are gloves that can be autoclaved um, that really need to be used. They're not just your regular treatment gloves. And this is important that your whatever team member or yourself, whoever's working in the sterilization area is wearing these and wearing them when they clean the room. It's extra protection uh, to prevent against puncture, et cetera. Um, they're more um, surgical than just say a dishwashing glove, but they feel sort of similar. Uh, but the idea is if you're not already giving these to your to your uh, team members, you wanna do that. They can each be identified with a marker or a stamp or what have you so that each one knows whose is whose. These can again be cleaned and reused, but make sure that your lab and your sterilization area team members are wearing heavy duty gloves. Obviously the masks we talked about, disposable uh, gowns, head covers, shoe covers. Um, and again, I see in the chat even a lot of concern about, you know, how do I see through the microscope? You know. I've tried a number of different goggles because the ones you saw me wearing are terribly uncomfortable, but I can see perfectly through the scope and they don't fog up. I got some more comfortable ones that have more of a convex type of look to them, like a ski goggle, and that actually really affected how well I could see through the microscope. So you have to play with it. Of course, the loops and a light, that's gonna be the big challenge, but I almost will guarantee someone will innovate, someone will invent something that is effective. So you can wear your loops, you can use your light and still be protected. But at this moment, I'm not so sure that that actually exists. So just take in mind what you have as your inventory for PPE. We know that things are back ordered. We understand that. So just do the best you can to have your orders in place and just be in really close communication with your reps. And so for instance, like your Cavo Cur Total Care, that's the type of rep that can really kind of guide you through this. Um, how to take on and remove your PPE. This is put out by the CDC. I'd recommend looking it up online at uh, you know cdc.gov. Uh, but in essence, it's all very logical. When I come out from the patient, and I saw some questions in here as well. So um, you know, when you're doing your exam, when you're greeting your patient, you're full on garbed in PPE. Like we're not like coming in with just a little bit of it and then waiting to see if they have treatment. So every time you come in and you leave the room like that. Now because my office is not real busy right now, I'm able to use another operatory as sort of my staging area where I get dressed, where I, where I get undressed. But they're recommending here that before you let the patient leave the room and you actually remove everything in the room so that you're not shedding any aerosol or particles that might have reached you into other spaces in the office. And so that's what this is about. Just logically, first you take your dirty gloves off, Okay, then I put a fresh pair of gloves on, then I start to take my goggles off, I disinfect those very carefully, then I start to take my gown off. And so basically I'm taking off and putting on my gear each and every time for a new patient. And so that means that when I go back to my desk, I'm not in my PPE. When That means that you're doing a lot of time doing this. Now you get better at it, but I wanna give you the idea that when you walk into the room, you are ready to rock and roll. And when you walk out, you have to disrobe. And so that's gonna take a little more time in getting used to, but I would recommend checking out these diagrams. They're very logical, quite honestly, but for the sake of time, I don't wanna go into it too much. Now, I wanted to talk a lot about leadership in this webinar because again, I'm talking about infection control and how to manage instruments, but really it's about setting a standard of saying to your team, I am here to protect you, I'm here to protect the patients, and I'm here to protect myself. And because of that, please understand, you might get too close to me and I'm gonna tell you, I need you six feet. You know, there's little things that we're so used to moving around each other that there's gonna be a new normal. So having a, essentially meetings with your staff and telling them, look, we need to get better. We need to essentially level up and being able to really have open communication about this gets everyone invested and make sure that everyone is being sort of a police of what's happening in the office. So when I have this staff meeting, you wanna really talk about how you want everything to be done the same way by everyone. It's gotta be done right. You wanna establish these protocols. Everyone's been out of the office for so long that this is the perfect time to start up a new measure of, of protocols. You really wanna have good expectations about remaining within social distancing. And I'm sometimes policing myself. I'll realize I'm talking to my, my office manager and I'm too close and I'll take a couple steps back, even though we're all masked. 
And that's the other thing in this picture is not accurate because everyone in my office is wearing a mask unless they're eating or drinking something. So this is another precaution if someone were to cough or sneeze, et cetera. So we want to really just say to say to your team, look, if you get too close to me, I'm going to say back off, but I mean it with love and it's nothing personal, but we all have to be really understanding of how important this is. And so when you set these standards right out of the gate, while people are still feeling fearful and still learning everything new, it's going to stick. And that way you can always be maintaining the, po the, the best possible practices. So I'm going to go through this really quickly. The key here is not the steps. Okay. The key, the reason I want to present this to you is to say that I believe that we as the doctors, the owners, the leaders, we need to be in the lab doing this with our team and all doing it together so that they can see, number one, how important this is because of how much you care. Number two, assuring that they're doing it safely and properly. And number three, assuring that it's consistent. So that if there's a question about what's going to be done, you can step in. So I'm talking about taking a hands-on leadership approach with our teams. And that includes cleaning trays of instruments and cleaning the rooms and everything else. So this is really an incredible opportunity for us to really stand tall as leaders. So again, just a reprocessing flow, just going to go through this very quickly. The most important thing, right, always is from the treatment room to the lab or sterile area, those instruments need to be secured so they can be delivered safely. And there's a number of different trays and things that you can incorporate to do this. But in essence, it means traffic control, making sure that someone with a full tray doesn't walk out into the hallway while someone else is walking by. Just very logical things. But these are the types of reminders you want to be presenting to your team so that they remember. Um, you know, a pre-soak, this is something called Empower Foam. Just, you know, you can spray it right onto the instruments right away. It starts to eat away at the debris, et cetera, and can, you know, take away some of the effort of, of what you have to do with your hand cleaning. Um, when you get in there, you could obviously have automatic cleaners using ultrasonics. Um, you can use brushes and things. Certainly with some of our endodontic files and instruments, we have to really work that material off of there, whether it's sealer or what have you. So this is a critical part in our sterilization process. Um, obviously, rinse, dry, and inspecting the instruments. So, um, you know, in any of the enzymatic materials needs to be rinsed off. Uh, the instruments need to essentially be clean before they're sterilized. And again, this is the basic tenets of infection control. As doctors, when you pick up an instrument, see something caked on there, immediately you, you cringe, right? Your skin crawls. And so this is the idea that you want to make sure that at this moment that your team understands how important it is that the instruments are clean. Um, lubrication, of course, is a critical part of maintenance with the instruments, making sure that they are properly lubricated. And this is just another step. And so, you know, MetroLube is an example. There are others on the marketplace, making sure that all the hinges and things continue to work properly. Preparing for sterile, whether it's, you know, what kind of pouches do you use? Do you wrap your cassettes? What type of indicator might they have? All of these things. This is the time to be considering that. Peel View is an example. Again, a, a Cur Total Care product. Uh, it's triple sealed. It's got indicators for ethylene oxide and for steam so that you know if it went through and processed properly. Um, some different types of, you know, dotted perforation, not just to make easy opening, but, you know, reevaluate everything you're doing and each product that you're using. And that's why I think sitting down with your rep, whether it's virtually or ultimately in person, being able to really discuss everything that you're using. Um, autoclave or cold sterile, of course, sterilization is the destruction of all microbial life, including bacteria, viruses, fungi, and spores. And spores are the trickiest one. And so we need to be sure that we're doing proper testing for that. With cold sterile, again, you have something like ProSide D, but you also have to be sure that you're testing your cold sterile solution to make sure that it's still effective. So there's something called MetroTest that allows you to test the glutaraldehyde, sorry, glutaraldehyde concentration so you can make sure it's active and making sure that you're always logging. So, you know, think about the fact that many of us probably have been a little lax, maybe on your spore testing, which we're going to talk about. Maybe you're testing of the cold sterile, but even logging and, and keeping a written record of when you're testing, what the results are. I think these are the types of things that are going to become much more standardized and become more things that can make us, you know, medic, medical legally liable. So let's be thinking about how we can get into the groove of making sure that we're actually in compliance with all the standards. So again, um, I hope that everyone is doing a weekly biological indicator 
for spores. So it's very easy to do. You just run it with one of your loads of, of instruments, but that has to be sent off and tested. And each, each sterilization unit that you use has to be identified so that you can find out if you have a problem to make sure that you're getting the sterilization that you need. Um, again, this is also appropriate with the cold sterile, as I mentioned, making sure that it's completely effective when you use it. And so moving forward again, we have to continually educate, adapt, shift, and just keep updating our staff and ourselves so that we are always being in compliance. And this is evolving so readily that it's almost important that you keep in contact with your colleagues, read newsletters, you know, get your email blasts and your, your text message updates so that you're in compliance. Watch a lot of these webinars so that you know exactly what's going on. Obviously a documentation system is critical. I think this is something we're gonna be held to a higher standard about, is having these weekly and even daily documentations of how we're monitoring our sterilization equipment. Your SDS books, making sure that any products you introduce they get a sheet, an SDS sheet into your book, making sure that you're keeping up with that. Many companies offer these online now, but just making sure that that's updated. And maybe even just assigning one of your assistants or, or whoever in your, in your practice that will be in charge of making sure that this documentation and infection control, whether it's for CDC, OSHA, state regulations, maybe set aside a certain amount of time a day for them to go online and get updates. And then lastly, understanding the products that you're using and understanding if the products you were using before COVID really are still applied to now. Maybe we all need to be reevaluating what we use to sterilize our offices and instruments. So I'm going to conclude there. Again, if you want to find me on Instagram or really anywhere, I keep the same handle, Dr. Brett Gilbert. Again, Access Endo is an online education platform for those of you that want to learn more about endodontics and then also about being a leader. Uh, Access Endo is not only a curriculum on endodontics training, but it's also a curriculum on personal growth and development. Because when I talk about going in that first day and standing tall as a leader, you need to have certain skills, how to manage stress, how to really keep yourself calm. You're going to hear a lot more about emotional intelligence as we work through this crisis. And that's something that I have some extensive training on, and I've incorporated that into this membership website. So I really hope that you'll join us at Access Endo. It's accessendo.org. And I thank you for joining us today. Sorry for the technical glitches, but I'm so glad that so many of you were able to return. And I'm going to start to read and, and answer some of these questions as well. And uh, again, appreciate everyone's attention. Um, CE certificates will be sent to you. Um, and that's something that... Um, uh, that I am not in control of, but the Cabo Kerr uh, company will be able to provide those for you. So I'm going to read through. So um, this is some great questions here that I was just sort of talking about. Here's one that really struck me from, from a doctor in Manhattan in New York. Um, they don't have a parking lot. Their patients don't drive to the, to the office. They walk or take a taxi. So how do we manage in close confines there? That's a tricky one. And I think that each of us, depending on our setting and where we are, we're going to have to be very innovative. So maybe it means that they call from their cell phone and you meet them down at the street level and you take their temperature and you give them the forms and maybe you have some type of stool that you could offer and sterilize and take up and down. But, you know, the reality is, is you really don't want them to enter your space until you know that they're they're healthy. And so maybe that means that you have a little space in the hallway that could potentially be used. So I don't have the direct answer, but I know that each of us is gonna have to be innovative and really, really um, open-minded as to what are the possibilities of how we can handle specific situations. Um, someone asked, what are your thoughts on the asymptomatic patient we're hearing about? My thoughts are, it means that just like with our old universal precautions, and I say old because they seem outdated to me now, um, but the reality is, is you have to assume that every patient in your chair is an asymptomatic carrier. And unless you've been tested yourself, you have to significantly consider that you may be an asymptomatic carrier. So again, it becomes down to universal precautions in, the, in that way. Um, do allow more time for patient appointments in between patients? Yes. This all takes a lot more time. It takes more time to clean the rooms. Basically, every surface, we spray the floors with a bleach uh, dilution in between each patient and rub that in. We're, we're spraying even the walls, uh, anywhere that can you know, have aerosol touch it. We emptied out the operatory, so every shelf, every surface, everything 
the monitors, everything is cleaned. And so I was talking, I'm going to get the, just because I had a um, text conversation just before. So what I was talking about is you'll see some of these foggers and it's a hypochlorous acid solution at a minimum, minimum of 200 parts per million. So basically, if you envision that you do your basic cleanup as we always have, but then you fog the room with this hypochlorous acid, and that would assure that every single surface in the office, from the walls to the floors to the blinds, everything would be disinfected. And that could allow us to regain some efficiency in turning over our rooms. Now, I had a question in here about, what about if I have multiple doctors working in the same office? Is it still gonna be just one patient in the office? It's a great question. You know, and that's gonna be an issue in my own office that I haven't had to confront just yet. But I think we'll start to see more talk. We'll start to see how we can maybe space out appointments. So at least we don't have anyone coinciding at the door, at the entryway. We never have anyone coinciding at the checkout desk. Um, all those types of things, maybe spacing which operatories we're using each time. Those are the logical solutions to that. Um, Someone was asking, am I concerned about running out of PPE, giving gloves and masks to the patient? And the, the answer is, is yes, but gloves seem to be in ready supply, which is very, very beneficial. And usually the mask that we're giving is all of our supply of the level one or the level two, which used to be everything that we wore. And so I think that in, when we use those up and those aren't available anymore, we may have to reevaluate. But for now, I feel very comfortable greeting the patient and knowing that they are covered immediately. Um, how to sterilize a thermometer. So the best way is either ask the patient to bring their own thermometer with them, which is an option. Number two is a touchless thermometer, like a like a infrared. And we have one. Look, I don't know that they're perfect, especially because we're taking the temperature at the door, which is outside, or even in our vestibule if, if they get that far. So, but it's it's still, you can tell if they have a high fever, it's going to ring. But an infrared no-touch thermometer would be ideal. Um, Yes, uh, Gr uh, Grace asked about the consent form. I'll see if it's possible to distribute that through the through the registration links. Um, so we're gonna have five more minutes and then we'll be out of here. So I'm just gonna see, um, let's see. Um, everyone's asking about the documents. Yes, I will share those. Um, let's see. Uh, sorry, it seems that N KN95 is not FDA approved. Maryland Southern Dental Society contracted these then pulled them back. Uh, the reality is, is that from my understanding, they have been pushed through. Maybe there's some pushback on that. Uh, but I'll tell you what, they're also telling, you know, in the UK, they're having a horrible problem right now uh, by having really very poor supplies of PPE. And so they're having doctors go in with whatever mask they have. So I don't know what the moment to moment is with the FDA. My understanding was the KN95 was approved. But if not, you're still way better off with that than a regular surgical mask. Uh, can you UVC the N95s? My understanding is yes. There are a number of different protocols to sterilize them. I haven't done it yet, but that towel sterilizer that I showed would be a UV. Um, what about level one or two for exams? No, as I mentioned, I, I walk in for my exam fully outfitted in my PPE. Uh, let's see here. How am I using the microscope? I addressed that. Um, the loops is tough. Air purifiers. Uh, so they actually do kill. So the air purifier I have has the UV light incorporated and the UV light denatures the DNA or RNA of the virus. It was designed for SARS. So the idea is actually a kill as opposed to just catching it into a filter. Um, let's see. Yeah. Insurance based practices. How do we afford all that? Maybe the additional coding will come in handy, but clearly there's a, a, a significant crisis associated with a lot of this. Right now, we're still trying to work through just the very beginning. Um, testing kits, I don't know enough about them or how much they cost. Uh, the billing code for the reimbursement, um, I believe it was 0999 for now. But if you go onto the AAE website or ADA, they have a whole write-up about uh, the coding for the special diagnostic testing. Um, and let's see if there's anything else I can hit here for you guys. Um, Face shields, yeah, there's a number of different face shields that are hard to get. That's why I went to the hardware store and got the closed eye science goggles. You could use a, a ski goggle as well. If I cut off, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so grateful everyone was here. Um, just wanted to see if there's any other quick um, 
things that I can answer. I was named the air purification system, a mine is surgically clean air. I've had it for a couple of years. They're out of Canada. Um, lunchroom, yeah, PPE needs to come off for the lunchroom, the bathroom, really anywhere but the treatment rooms in the lab. So it's a lot of taking it off and putting it back on through the day, which is time consuming but important. Um, thank you for serving. Oh, thank you. Someone acknowledge me for serving patients in this time. I appreciate that. Um, so glad everyone was here. Um, this was awesome. Again, so grateful for you all finding us again after our difficulties in the beginning, but so glad I could share this with you. Uh, follow me at Dr. Brett Gilbert on Instagram, on Facebook. Um, I, I'm doing a lot of webinars, great opportunities for free CE. And of course, join me at accessendo.org. It's a very comprehensive training program, really consumable, entertaining modules, a lot of collaborations with experts around the world, lots of different ways that I'm able to teach. And so I really hope you'll join us. Um, you can join for a month, you can join for a year, whatever you're comfortable with, but I know it's going to be very beneficial. So thank you so much for joining, wishing everyone safety, health, Hang in there. We're going to get through this. It's all doable, but we have to work together. We have to continue to adapt and we have to continue to innovate. But most importantly, being a, an empathetic leader and being able to stand in front of your team and let them know that you have their back and that you're, you're really all about following the proper protocols. Sending love from Chicago. Can't stop, won't stop. It's been great spending this time with you. Mwah.